Hello and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar on detection of and phasing of hybrid accessions in a target captured data set. My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Officer and I will also be your host for this webinar. This webinar is part of a series in which we aim to share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools available to the life sciences community. Each month we hear from our national and international peers who tell us about a topic in bioinformatics that we hope will help Australian researchers to achieve their best agricultural, environmental and medical research. You can keep in touch and up to date about the latest news and events from Australian Biocommons via the links you see on your screen. Before we begin the webinar today, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. In my case in Brisbane, this is the Turrbal and Yuggera people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today we are thrilled to welcome Dr Lars Nauheimer, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Australian Tropical Herbarium in Cairns. Lars investigates the reticulated evolution of orchids and other plant groups. His research interests lie in the systematics of plants and in particular, their biodiversity and biogeographic history. Most of his recent work focuses on the development of bioinformatics tools and workflows to utilize the potential of next generation sequencing approaches for resolving hybrids and gain insights into reticulated evolution. Welcome to the webinar, Lars, and I'll now hand over to you to walk us through. Well, thank you very much, Melissa. Um, let me and yeah, welcome everyone. I see we are around 20 people here. That's great. See so much um, interest. Um, let me share my screen so you can see the presentation. So as much as I said, this is a, a webinar, um, which is which is also part of the genomics of Australian plants um, webinar and workshop series for analyzing target capture data sets. And you might, yeah, there you go. Um, you might have um, have seen the other webinar, which was from held by Alexander um, schmidt um about conflict in multi-gene data sets. And um, today I'm talking about the detection and phasing of hybrid and hybrid and target capture data sets. If you haven't seen the first one or want to see mine later, they should all be available online. Um, and so both webinars um, uh, thought to support the workshop series, which um, which is um, in the beginning of July and is part of the ASBS conference. Um, and so, and they all deal with target capture data. And the first one is about assembly of raw reads using Hypiper. The second one is about paralogy, paralogy detection, a resolution using the Young and Smith pipeline. And the third one um, is the detection and phasing of hybrids using hype phaser. So what we're talking about today. And um, <clears throat> the um, be aware that the, um, the deadline closes soon for to send an express expression of interest um, so to to get into these um, workshops great so before we start i just want to um to show some um uh, start with some definitions um so hybridization is used in many many ways but here in biology is what we generally refer to the crossing of two species or genetically divergent populations um, as that's sometimes not hard to distinguish and not easy to distinguish. And <clears throat> so a hybrid is therefore um, offspring of an hybridization event that contains the genetic material from both parental lineages. And an allele is a variant of the gene which can come from either um, haplotype and the haplotype is the group of alleles that uh, or the part of the genome that's inherited from the parent. And <clears throat> we distinguish um, homoploid hybridization and polyploid hybridization um, and the homoploid hybridization um, um, is when the, the, the hybrid has the same chromosome number than the, as the parent um, and um, while the polyploid uh, um, hybridization involves an, uh, a genome duplication and the first one is more frequent but more often um, results in back crossing while the polyploid hybridization 
um, often um, um, constitutes a direct um, um, isolation from the parental um, villages, um, so they can't back cross. Um, and both of these I'll refer to as hybrids. And, um, and so whether they are um, recent or they could also be ancient polyphyllization. So I, I use the term hybrid in a relatively broad sense here. And we also know that when parents are more um, di um, di diverse, divergent, then the, the offspring is, is more likely to be polyploid. And <clears throat> um, while well, hybrids are often mostly sterile, and um, hybridization usually does not lead to any speciation. Um, it, it can happen, and um, we have lots of species that originated in hybridization. <clears throat> and what is needed is like the, that there is a reproductive isolation, so there's no backcrossing into the parental um, lineages, and um, which is then called introgression. And often we have like a spatial um, isolation or so, but it can be many other ways. Um, and integration itself can lead to put a pointer here. Um, integration can lead to um, 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 back or the back crossing into the parental lineages after a hybridization event can lead to um, the exchange of alleles in, um, in in the species. So there can be a gene flow between species um, through a hybridization event, even though there is no hybrid speciation. And <clears throat> We also um, realized more and more in the last years through genomics that, um, that hybridization and polyploidization are like an important um, driver in evolution. And, and so we found um, through paralogs and we found more and more um, um, whole genome duplications in the history of plants. Um, and often an important um, um, events are like in the stem lineages of the, um, of the seed plants or angiosperms. And, and we are getting more and more data that we have lots of plant groups have, um, have whole genome duplications um, in their past, and even animals and fungi. And so, so what's going on is that we have um, genome duplication or polyploidizations followed by diploidizations, where gene duplicates are um, re reduced again and removed, and um, so the, the organism doesn't carry around more and more um, genes all the time. <clears throat> so it's, this is not termed to, to, um, or made the term slinky of life, where we, where we circle between diploidization and polyploidization. So at the end, it's like the question is not whether the plant is a polyploid or has been a polyploid, but when it has been a polyploid. Um, and when we talk about polyploids, we have to um, take into account that not, not all are um, hybrids. We also have um, non-hybrid polyploids. Um, so we distinguish between allopolyploidy, which is a hybrid, and the autopolyploidy, which is um, from the same species. And that's probably, um, they're probably in equal proportions. Um, um, and, um, and both can um, retain copies um, for a long time that persist in the genomes, um, gene copies that persist as um, paralogs. So <clears throat> in total, what I have the picture I want to paint here is that the genome evolution is um, rather complex. So we have hybrid speciation that um, generates new lineages um, with, with novel characters. We have intercression that even there is no speciation. We have um, exchange of genes and we have um, genome duplication followed by um, 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 reductions and um, we end up with different gene groups and so on. So the whole picture is often a bit messy. And, um, and so in addition, we have um, autopolyploidy that, that generates paralogous genes that we can have in the genome, uh, even without a hybridization, and also um, deep coalescence, um, like incomplete lineage sorting, where alleles are sorted different to the speciation events, and that lead to, to exchange of alleles and, and the mix. And <clears throat> all this um, um, presents like problems for the phylogenetics. So I'm going to short talk about what, what is the means of hybrids in phylogenetics. And the, the, the combination of um, genetic material from divergent lineages um, in hybrids leads to conflict um, and conflicting phylogenetic signal because we use the genes in phylogenetics to understand reconstructive relationships. And if we have um, information from um, divergent species combined in one sample, um, we get um, basically poor glade support at best, or often a false um, reconstruction of relationships. 
but the results depend heavily on the methods um, that we use and in particular the assembly so how are the sequences assembled how do we get to them um, and does the divergent signal mixed up or can it be separated um, or can it can it be removed or is it even noticed at all do we know that there's a hybrid in there or not um, and then how are the, the sequence handled are the um, different loads are concatenated uh, plastic or nuclear and, and can they can phase sequence be linked um, and of course, the analysis at the end is important, whether it actually takes into account um, a reticulated um, 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 evolution or not, many do not. <clears throat> so traditionally, in, um, we use Steiner sequencing, which often only recovered um, blasted data, and so we couldn't really infer anything. And um, when we had ITS uh, and blasted data together, we often could have found, um, um, if we found like conflict between the data sets, we could um, um, assume that there has been something um, hybridization going on, or we often call it chloroplast capture. And um, there are only a few, so few studies with um, single copy nuclear genes that, that actually could, could look closer where we found different versions of the, of the alleles from both parents. And some could face that. And um, as an example, um, here's one study from um, Sang and Sang in 1999. And they phased the alleles of the nuclear gene um, from, from both parental lineages. So at the left, we have an ITS3, a nuclear ITS3, where, where one species groups in another clade than it does in the chloroplast MATK3. And in a, in a tree where they separated the phases, the alleles, um, both alleles group with their with uh, different uh, clades, and so they could could um, reveal where the where the parents belong to. And <clears throat> this is a quite good approach, but it has like the limitations of Sanger sequencing that we have a very limited amount of nuclear loci, and um, we don't get good resolution. Um, <clears throat> so now, however, however, now we have um, target capture sequencing. Which, um, which changed the game a little bit. So we have hundreds of nuclear genes available um, and that are based on um, transcript data. Um, so we have mainly exons and, um, and we use Illumina short read sequencing. So we get millions and millions of reads that are relatively short and um, <clears throat> that we have to um, put together. And we, but we get reads from all alleles, all haplotypes um, that are available. Um, so um, we should get information from both parental lineages. So that, that um, opens up a lot of opportunities with the high number of nuclear genes and that we have all variants recovered. Um, however, um, there are some main challenges and probably the main challenge is the assembly of the short reads into phased alleles um, because we have like these short reads that we don't know where they belong to. And, uh, and then if we get phased alleles, would they need to be linked across all the genes that we have, um, all the exons? And, um, and at the end, another challenge is that, that uh, due to the large data sets that we have, um, the analysis of in, in transparent. So we have, um, uh, we use command line tools, so we get an output and then we, we don't really know what, what actually happened there. And to have a look at the assembly methods, um, the two main methods are the novo assembly um, and the reference-based assembly. And the de novo, which is commonly used, so where sequence reads are matched to each other. Um, to generate a context sequence. And um, while in the reference based assembly, we have the sequences mapped to a reference. Um, and so it then generates a consensus sequence. And most pipelines use a combination of both um, to um, yeah, first like mapping reads to a single locus and then um, de novo with those reads that match there. Um, but have, let's have a look what happens if we include um, hybrids. So on the left, we have like a normal diploid non-hybrid and we have, um, we have sequence reads um, that are rather similar. And on the other hand, we have um, either diploid hybrid or polyploid hybrid that um, has um, um, very divergent reads. And um, if we look in the mapping scenario, where we have um, all the reads mapped to a reference up here and um, then gray where they agree with each other. So here in total, we have a very high agreement. There are some small dots and colors that are um, just sequencing errors, um, but we have a good coverage and we, we, can, we can be sure about the, the um, sequence that we get. Um, however, if we have a look, if we have a look at the heterozygous locus, um, we, we might get some where the alleles are a bit different, like here. So we see like that, that line is like um, we have 
green and um, blue. So we have different alleles and uh, different nucleotides here. So that's an heterozygous site, um, or we call it also called like a SNP, um, so a single nucleotide polymorphism. And this is to, to be expected in a normal diploid organism that has different alleles. Um, but however, if we have a hybrid in there, we get a picture that looks like this. So we have like a high amount of um, SNPs in the data set. And, um, and if we look closer, we can actually also see that they line up. So we can see that, um, that we have here two different alleles in there. So um, that, that correspond to the haplotypes. And if we separate them, um, we, we, can, um, we can get the sequence of the alleles of the parents. And in this case, it's easy. We can do it here by hand and uh, connect them. However, um, we also run into problems um, when, when we have gaps um, where we can't connect the, um, the SNPs. For example, here, these, these two SNPs are further away than the read length. And so we don't really, we don't really know which two alleles here cor correspond to the, to, the, to the SNPs here. So um, and to look at it in a different way, um, when, if we assume we know the alleles, the, um, and we have here also we have three different um, um, SNPs. And um, the two on the left we can connect because we have a rate that connects um, the, the two, um, the two um, uh, the one allele. Um, so we can, can know that A and C uh, is one allele and T and A is the other one. But we can't connect the, the third one. We don't know whether it's a G or T. And, and that's a problem for the novel sequencing. So what happens in the novel assembly, um, <clears throat> we can either get, in this case, it's more as a 50-50 it could um, connect them correctly or wrongly. So, and if it connects wrongly, we get a chimeric sequence. Um, and in generally, often the assembler um, decides on the um, frequency, or so it takes the, the nucleotide, which is like the highest frequency or other um, uh, measures. But we often don't know whether what we get out. And in contrast, the, however, we, we can get phase studies if it connects them correctly, and we can get two versions. Um, and in contrast, we have the reference mapping, where we can um, either get an ambiguity code, um, which, which tells us um, the, um, the different um, nucleotides that are there, um, or we can use a majority rule, which has been used for a bit, but that's, that's um, probably not useful for your hybrids because we get very likely get chimeric sequences. But the uh, ambiguities uh, represent a way to kind of disarm or um, that that conflict in the in the data set and some um, um, phylogenetic analysis can can work with that um, so to to shortly sum up the um, de novo um, assembly can potentially recover um, chimeric um, sequences and and then it depends what the what the workflow does with it for example in high piper it would use the longest context like if we oh, sorry, if we get multiple contexts um, Hyperbole would use the longest, or if they are two longest, they will use the one that is closest related to the um, to the target sequence, and um, marks the other one. And then um, <clears throat> we can also improve the out, um, the output if we have some readback phasing, where um, um, algorithms look at actively for haplotypes and try to connect them, um, and that works um, especially good with uh, or much better with paired end reads, where we where you can have like the the read lengths are much, much higher. So we can actually, um, with more, with good, com with better confidence, connect the alleles well. However, we only get then the um, sequences, um, the alleles uh, um, phased, and or especially only the exons, um, because if we have a gene that connects, con consists of multiple exons, we have troubles connecting those. And additionally, we have no information on the divergence in the data set or whether that there's even like um, there has been uh, that could be a chimeric um, um, sequence or not. And in contrast, the um, reference mapping um, cannot face alleles. So because it always mangles together the data, the reads, and the majority rule is rather useless. And but the ambiguity codes can kind of remove or disarm the conflicting signal. And also um, we can that contains information on the amount of um, of SNPs in the data set. So and recording these SNPs can provide valuable information on the divergence in the whole data set, which is important for later on. Um, so 
in general, the, um, the, there are workflows or standard workflows um, um, select um, to do a mapping to select get the reads and then do it in over assembly and, um, and collect those and give it an output at some, uh, also connect exons together to, to genes. Um, and there have been a few that also um, faced alleles um, so they did some, some extra steps and they generally used an over assembly with readback phasing to, to get um, to connect those. But um, when there are multiple exons in a gene, they then only use the largest block that was phased. And, um, and so they, they did not link the, the alleles across the haplotypes. So um, for any concatenated analysis, um, you, um, the alleles get mixed up. And also the results were mixed. Some said, oh yeah, that improved and the analysis, some didn't find that. Um, so I then developed um, a different approach to the, to the phasing. And um, my idea was then to phase the reads instead of the alleles, because the alleles already might have mangled up data. Um, and, and how to do it was then to map the reads simultaneously to multiple reference references, and then separating reads according um, to, their, to their mapping into different read files. And to, to illustrate that a bit better, um, if we have the left, if we have sequence reads from a hybrid um, that are mixed, and we, we have, we know the reference, or we know the parents, we have the reference from them, and we map them simultaneously to both, then we get reads that map only to one, um, will go in one pile, and reads that map to the other, where we have like a, a heterozygous sites on the reads, they will map to the other reference. And then gray reads that map to both will, can be put in both piles. So we, so we make piles of the reads, and um, and so and, and um, extract them, and which then represent phased haplotypes. But we have only the read files, so we then um, throw them into the assembly and um, and then do a phylogenetic analysis. And if everything works well, we should find that the um, the the hybrid the phased accessions um, group with the parental lineages in different clades. Um, and but now, how in most cases we we wouldn't really know what the parents are. So so what do we do if we don't know who the parents are? Um, and we can we can get around that by just mapping all reads to all clades. So um, if we map reads to to multiple references that cover all available clades, we should find that uh, and then record to which clades the reads match. We should find that um, hybrid should match to the reads that. Um, where the parental lineages are, uh, the, to the references that are close to the parental lineages. So, and to do that, um, or to, to illustrate it better, uh, on the left, we have a phylogeny. So we need to know phylogeny. We need to know the clades and select suitable references, and then take the reads and map them to all the references. And then we, we record how many, what proportions of reads map to either of the references. And, and then also like several of them will match to multiple, but we are just generally interested in the reads that are actually only mapped to one reference. And then if you collect the data and get a nice table, we can then, um, we can then see which of our samples are actually hybrids that will have reads that map into different clades. And then we can choose the, the respective um, references and phase them to, to those. Um, and like, the, like I showed in a step before. So, and this approach has um, some advantages. So primarily it, it um, does the phasing before the assembly and therefore it avoids all the linking of heterozygous sites and uh, also the avoids of linking of, of the phased alleles. And it should also work with any amount of divergence um, and um, which then kind of depends where you get references for that. And, um, and it should also work with a high level ploidy where um, reads can map to not only two, but three, four, five clades. And, um, but the main disadvantages here are that if we require a phylogenetic framework to find those suitable references. And also we might not even find any suitable reference um, if they got extinct or we don't have them sampled or so. Um, however, that all have required um, a, a workflow pushing data around generating trees, looking at that. And, and so, um, but that, um, then led to me develop this workflow that um, is now called Hype Phaser. And Hype Phaser is then um, combined a workflow that 
that is um, built for the detection and phasing of the hybrid sessions. And um, it heavily utilized the mapping of reads to multiple references, first to assess the clade associations of the samples, and also then to, to phase the read files. And in addition, we use this um, SNP counting um, to, to in the consensus sequences to detect hybrids and also to remove parallels, um, which is a handy thing I'm going to illustrate a bit later. And um, it, it builds on the assembly pipeline high piper. Um, so I didn't want to amend the wheel again and just um, use the output of high piper and, and work with that. It combines um, several command line scripts and R scripts. And it's, um, it's all uses only few and freely available tools like SAM tools, BBMap, and so on. And it uh, is, um, needs some um, Linux um, operating system. Um, so now to give an overview of how the workflow um, um, looks like, um, this is a, a simple workflow, which, um, which is kind of what, what is usually done. Um, one gets the, the reads, um, and then we have make an assembly, for example, with high pipe or something else which generates context sequences, and then we uh, align them and um, make a phylogenetic analysis and get a tree. So that's a simple one. And now this uh, um, is something I extend to um, um, there we are. Um, extend with several more steps. Um, but it all looks a bit more complicated than it is, although it's a, it's a little bit to get through. And I'll give like a, a rough overview. Um, so um, basically, we we not only use the assembly from HyPiper, but we add an assessment of SNPs and optimize the data set, um, and then do um, use the, or make a phylogenetic analysis together a, a framework phylogeny that we can use for the reference selection. So we can understand where the where the um, references for the clades, and then we do a clade association analysis um, in which we um, which just um, find the, the relevant references for the hybrid phasing. And then we do the hybrid phasing in which we generate the read files, um, new read files for the hybrids. And then those read files need to be, um, go back to the first step basically. So they again need to be assembled and optimized. Um, and, um, and then we can combine those sequence lists with the original ones um, that were not phased. Um, to generate a combined data set. And this combined data set, we then um, can again uh, align and um, do our preferred phylogenetic analysis. <clears throat> so what is a hype phaser? Um, what's the, it built for? Um, it is kind of, a kind of a normal standard phylogenetic study where we try to understand the relationships in a closely related clade. Um, and it's best if we have a relatively complete sampling, especially if all major clades are involved and the most species, and they might contain hybrids or other polyploids, but don't need to. And the data set is, of course, target capture sequencing. We need a lot of nuclear loci, and the input is just the sequence reads and um, the target sequence file. So to, to start with the workflow, um, we start with the assembly. Um, in this case, um, we use HyPiper to, to get the context. And HyPiper is a great program. It's, it's really quick and fast. And um, it basically, it uses the reads, um, generates the um, uh, context for each exon based on the normal, and then concatenates the exons to, to get um, the gene sequence. And all, optionally also can give you intron sequences. And um, <clears throat> we have, um, Chris Jackson, um, he, he um, improved uh, the high piper version um, and um, built a nice container for it, um, um, added some more features and, and um, eliminated some bugs. And so, so that's, um, um, which is very handy, which we're going to use in the workshop as well, and which is also featured in, um, in the workshop, um, um, in the first workshop of the ASVS conference. So you should check that out, definitely. Um, and also gives a very detailed overview of how high piper works. Um, so we use that to, to get our consensus sequences. But in the addition step, we do um, uh, the SNP assessment and the data set optimization. So, um, and this works um, by um, looking at the ambiguity codes in the consensus sequences. Uh, and we use that to detect hybrids. And you can also estimate how close or distant related the parents are of a putative hybrid. 
And um, we can also detect and remove um, putative paralogous genes. Um, so and how to how that works, I'll just like jump back to, to the mapping. If we see some um, common examples of, of the reference mapping um, where we have like a, a, a allele divergence, a very small allele divergence of a probably good species, which has very little anything else. So we get like an allele divergence, which is like the proportion of SNPs in the data set of 0.17%. And if we look at the hybrid, here we count that we have 21 SNPs in 613 base pairs. So we have like 3.4% of allele divergence. And this should also be the same across the data set um, and, um, when we look at a hybrid. But we get also some other weird things. Um, we get um, also mappings like this, um, where we have like a probably a highly paralogous um, um, gene, or we have like um, errors in the assembly or so on the bait um, construction or so, and um, where we have like really high values um, for, for the divergence. And but we can also get something like this, where we have multiple exons here, there are three or actually four multiple exons, and um, three of them have barely any allele divergence, and then one is, um, is quite messy. So again, here we have like some parallax in there in a relatively normal, good species normally, and we get an allele divergence that is kind of intermediate. So um, <clears throat> now the question is, um, like also up here, I, I said it's a hybrid because I know that, but this pattern could also occur just by a normal, um, by a normal um, paralog um, where we have two versions in there. So how can we distinguish um, hybrids from paralogs? And, and it is rather simple um, in that hybrids should have like a high allele divergence across all genes, because we assume that every gene has like um, alleles from both parents. And the allele divergence should also correlate with the divergence of the parental species or lineages. And so we just have to compare the allele divergence between the species. On the other hand, parallax should have um, a higher allele divergence compared to normal genes. So, so we want to compare the allele divergence between genes. And um, we do this here in two steps. I first show the first one. Um, so hyper hypophaser gives us then some graphs. And and here, one of the graphs, which has quite a lot of information, um, plots the allele divergence, so the proportions of SNPs um, uh, versus the locus heterozygosity, so the proportions of loci with SNPs. And in a hybrid, we assume that, that almost all loci should have um, uh, SNPs. Um, and in a normal species, there might be quite a few uh, homozygous um, loci where we don't have um, divergent alleles. So, <clears throat> In this example in Telemitra, where we have quite quite a lot of hybrids, we see up here we have we have high um, high um, heterozygosity and also high allele divergence. Um, and on the other side of the graph, we have quite amount of of uh, samples that have low values for both. And some have like a lower allele divergence, some have a bit higher one or more low side with with alleles. Um, and and then we have some in between. So so we can assume that up here we have hybrids. And down here we have good species in the middle, there might be something going on where we want to look closer. So, um, and, and that could be, could be hybrids, it could be introgression, um, it could be diploidization, it could be good species just with a higher divergence or the diversity. So there's a lot and we kind of want to look closer into that. But up here, we see that they, all those should be hybrids. And indeed, we have here in the middle field, we have hybrids that are, have very diverse parents. And up here, we have even um, higher polyploids, so where we have like multiple um, clade associations later. And, um, <clears throat> and this is a very useful graph to do, even if you don't expect to have hybrids in your data set, you can just run that and see whether there are some weird samples in there or not. And the other measure uh, we look at is when we compare the allele divergence um, of the genes, we can detect parallax. So here we get two graphs. Um, one is where we do an average um, um, allele divergence of all genes across all samples. So down here we have the genes, and it's an average across all samples. And we see that the majority of, of genes have like relatively low values, and then some have really high values. And one might decide to remove them from the data set, because this is then probably what we saw before, where we have like 14% as an average across all um, across all 
um, taxa. So they are they are probably not good loci to include. And, and we would assume that paradoxes are shared between species, um, but not necessarily. We can also have um, outlier or paradox that are only in each species or in a low number of species, so just like sister species or so. And so we also compare the amount of um, SNPs of each locus in each sample. And here combined in a box plot. So each box plot here is a sample. And we also see that um, this is now a bit cut off, but we have like here the ones with very low allele divergence in general. They have also some low side that have much higher one. So we might also decide to remove them and hype phaser um, of a script that just um, does it automatically. And you, know, you can set thresholds like here to say, okay, I want these ones removed. Um, and this um, information of the parallax, um, like in this case, we have only a few and you might be happy to remove them, but you also might get different results. For example, it could look like this. Um, if you get a graph that has like this, then we have like, um, you have um, too many paradox basically. So um, there are definitely some <clears throat> more things going on. And for that, you wanna check out the workshop for paralogy resolution. Because it's not enough to just remove a few. They have to have like heavy, high amount of paradox a lot um, in your in your group, and you you want to want to figure out what happens there. <clears throat> so, and in addition to that, high phaser also gives um, some other measures for dataset optimization, in which we can remove um, poorly recovered loci or samples and um, and outliers, so we can um, Im improve the the dataset um, if we want to. And as output, we get um, context and consensus sequences. So either as a hype phaser gives us or with ambiguity codes, we get raw as hype, hype hyper was give us or optimized. So like removed um, parallax and everything. And we get lists per loci and um, per sample. Um, so, and this we can use as input then to, um, to generate um, the phylogeny, uh, to do the phylogenetic analysis. And um, we can use, um, <clears throat> Um, any any um, um, any method, um, just like a short um, short um, info or like recommendation. So as input, you get context or consensus, and you can use some clean from the parallax. And um, and in general, for target capture data, you would probably want to do a supermatrix or concatenated, as well as G tree analysis, um, because we have so many genes. You wanna you wanna check out both. And bootstrap is also not really enough anymore if you have this big data set. So you also want to use concordance factors to, to have a better grasp on the, uh, on the clade support. And networks in this case can be useful too, because they, they are quick to do and they show you where reticulations could be. Um, so now with that um, phylogeny, we can go to the next stop. We can, we can select clades and we can um, we can then um, select the um, relevant um, clade references. Um, so and this, with that step, we get then um, a clade association where we can get the references that are important for phasing. And so as a recap, we have the tree and we select suitable references. We map all the samples against the reference and, and record the proportions of reads that match to a single reference. And so we get a table that we then, um, that could look something like this, where we have our samples and we have proportions of reads that map to each reference. And we would expect like here that we have the ones that have high allele divergence and have locus heterozygosity, so like the hybrid, and indeed they match and they map, have reads mapping into two clades. And we can then say, okay, sample one, we map, but we phase to reference nine and 16, it's because the parent, parents will be in that clade. And so that's an input for the phasing step, um, which we, um, which also works as I showed before, where we use only the references that are selected to, to match. And then we not only record the proportions, but we sort the reads into different files to get um, accessions that represent the um, haplotypes of the parents. And, um, and so, and then we have the read files that of the phased accessions that we then um, use again to, um, to assemble. Um, and then we can um, run it to the high phaser part to assess the SNPs. And we can compare how much we reduce the amount of conflict in the data set and um, we can optimize it. We remove the same um, low site and then the other ones. 
and then we can combine those that data set with the um, original one um, but remove of course the non-phased versions of them so um, we have then the phased accessions and the, the other not phased accessions together and and this can then be fed into the um, phylogenetic genetic analysis again we align them uh, make trees and and ideally um, the, um, the the hybrids um, that we face the phased accessions will um, pop out close to where the parents are <clears throat> to um, just have a short um, outlook how that how that would look like um, um, here this is something um, a cutout of uh, a bigger phylogeny from the from the paper in which that, um, the workflow is published on the panties and um, we see here on the left we have the original um, non-phase data set and hybrids are in red and in blue are the clade references that were selected and so we have here down here, for example, Brookia and Ventricosa, which groups with Ventricosa <coughs> as a clade. And on the other hand, we have different hybrids um, between Ventricosa and other species that were outside of the clade that also group basal here to this, to this clade. And, um, and on the right, we then see um, the hybrids in, in, in other colors. And we have in green, we have Brookia and Ventricosa, which here one phased accession that was phased to that reference here in blue, and it, it, it is close its sister to Brookii. And on the other hand, it's sister to Ventricosa. So we can um, confirm the parents. And the other hybrids here um, also group with Ventricosa in that clade. And um, in addition to that, um, we, we also see an increase in the, uh, in the support values, and especially in gene concordance factors. So we find that the data set has a much higher concordance um, because um, basically conflict is removed of the data set. So um, I hope I could give you a short overview um, of how it works. It's like the workflow is a bit complex and there are lots of steps and I could only um, brush through it. But if you want more information, um, you can find it and the software's on GitHub. There's also a wiki. There's some um, hopefully all steps um, explained. And um, the publication is at the moment available as a preprint on bioarchives and soon should be published in, uh, in applications for plant sciences. Um, then um, here's also a list of references um, if you want to um, look up things as, um, um, to, to explain where the graphs come from. And last, of course, I um, want to thank you everyone very much for your attention. I hope um, things made sense and I hope that um, you have some questions for me and definitely don't forget to check out the workshops and um, especially send your interest of ex um, express of interest through soon before we close that. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lars. We do have time yeah, for questions. Fine. Please do write them into... um, There are some questions in the... Um, yes, there's the a couple coming through already and I'm just going to remind people that they can ask their questions by writing them in the Q&A box. Yeah. This person's actually started with a compliment saying, great program, it's mm -hmm. nice to hear. And then they ask, do you foresee any issues working with UCE capture data set versus Exxon caption data? Um, no, um, definitely not. Um, I think the um, where we, we still we still should find reads um, that come from different haplotypes, and so that's kind of the um, the the advantage of the workflow that um, that it takes into account the the reads and not like the assembly itself. So um, should also work with, with some UCs, um, in my opinion. And I just built this workshop, this workflow on top of Hypiper, which is then built for working with exons and transcriptome data. Um, but um, it should be easily adapted for, for um, other workflows. Are there any more questions for Lars this afternoon? Oh, here we go. Here's a question. Hey. It says, um, thanks, Lars. That was a really useful presentation. Does Hypaser choose the references for you for you from different clades in the tree in the last step of the phasing, or does the user choose them? And how many references are used in that step? That's a very good question, um, and it, it's very relevant. the The user has to choose, choose that, and um, and there are like lots of um, things to take care of from how to use it. So. Um, it, it is very useful to have a, a tree and also plotted the 
the other information on how divergent each data, each um, reference is, because you don't want to accidentally use that hybrid as well. So you want to have um, a reference that that represents um, the clade um, and also like that that has like a lower leader divergence and low locus heterozygosity. And also you want to have a sample that has lots of loci recovered because sometimes it's very uneven in your data set. Um, and so um, you want to make sure that you get good references. Um, and then you have the second um, issues you want you you have to the, the amount of um, of um, clade reference uh, might vary a lot for what you're looking for. And you might want to do one analysis with just um, the major clades, and then you want to have like another analysis with with more with a finer resolution. And the further away they are, the more reads you have that don't match to any. And the closer they are, you have more reads that match to, to multiple. So you, you might end up with very different results. And so what I found is very useful to make multiple clade association analysis to actually understand what's going on there. Um, and this is also relatively easy to do then and very advised. So you can, you can see actually what, what happens. You know? And then we have a related question to that is, do you have any good rules for picking references yeah, and clades? Yeah, exactly, that's a related question. And yeah, and that's that's basically it. You want to have a good representation. You want to have um, low allele divergence. So you want to have like a good clean species. And um, and then you want to have the, the whole tree, the group that you're interested in, you want to have represented as, as good as possible. And sometimes not possible when you have like, when you see that, um, that it should be clearly a hybrid, but it doesn't match to anything. And so you can assume that, um, that yeah, you're missing a clade and that could be just an extinct one. So if it's a polyploid, an, an ancient polyploid. And, um, um, but yeah, and this is, these are steps that I wanna, will show more clearly and what to look for in, in the workshop as well, where we can get in more details. Mm. Great, thank you. Yeah. Another question has mm -hmm. just come in and this question is, um, what is your likely outcome if hybrids are included, but their parents are not? Um, that is um, a good question also, and I found that you don't really need to have the parents um, in there. Um, you, you should have those um, um, lineages that are, um, or like if you have something in the clade of the parents, which is closely related, then they should map as well. For example, down here we have the the um, hybrid accession, the phased accession is, is mapped to a different species. It's not mapped to Brookei, but to a, um, a closely related species, and that works. So it will then still fall in that clade. So you don't really need the parents. And it's often the case uh, in this in that study that I present in a paper, we kind of included hybrids where we know what the parents are. But um, in other data sets that I work with, we had no idea. And then you see where they come out and you actually see what, what the parents should be. Um, um, so, so yeah, it works with, with quite um, with with taxa that, that are not exactly closely related or like not not exactly the parents, but relatively closely related. And then it all depends on the divergence in the in the data set and in your group, um, how close you can go. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. We have time for one more question. If anybody would like to ask one. Mm, great, very good question as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just um, best is write me an email, um, and and I will try to to um, to respond. Um, I'm very happy to whatever have a short Zoom meeting and we can look at the data. There's, it is it is all rather complex and it often depends on the data set, um, uh, the group that you work with, and um, so there's a lot of things that you can um, that where you can do a different interpretation. And so I'm very happy to have a look at, at the output and help to run through. And if there, I always hated when I tried out and, and workflow and then somewhere it stuck. So now I can't install this dependency or I have issues with finding this one step and then I just couldn't continue. And so please um, contact me. I'm happy to help out and um, happy to, to look um, with someone on the data and, and help interpretation and how to continue. And where can people find your contact details? Um, Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, probably Google. Last now I'm at Cairns, um, ATH. Um, <clears throat> that should work. Um, yeah, 
I think I didn't, I will include it also in the, in the, the slide should be available and I will write my contacts in the beginning. I think I didn't do that here now, but I will include that. Um, so yeah, I'll put my email address there. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we will need to leave it there for questions for today. Uh, before we finish the webinar, I have a couple more things to tell you. Okay, so there we go. So as we've mentioned a few times during the webinar, this has been part of a series that the Genomics for Australian Plants Initiative has been running. You can watch the recording of the first webinar, which was about conflict in multi-gene data sets on the Australian Biocommons YouTube channel. And as Lars has shown you, the, the registrations and expression for interest for those workshops are closing this week. There is more information about those on the conference website. Uh, generally, if you'd like to know more about bioinformatics related events that are coming up, you can have a look at the Biocommons website. We do have a webinar coming up on getting started in command line and also one on getting started with deep learning uh, later this month and next month. So once again, thank you, Lars, for a very informative webinar and thank you to everybody for joining us today as well. Thank you very much. Finally, to acknowledge our funding, the Australian Biocommons is enabled by NCRIS funding via Bioplatforms Australia. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope to see you again in another webinar soon. Enjoy the rest of your day, and bye for now.